across the state and around the world. UMB makes the world more just, more enlightened, healthier, and more humane. We are UMB. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. A schoolyard battle over reopening Maryland schools. There is no public health reason for county school boards to keep students out of schools. It becomes very confusing for our educators and then that builds up a level of anxiety. Improving mental health resources. You know, we likely won't have this opportunity again, so we want to make sure we get it right. And Maryland says goodbye to Senate President Emeritus Mike Miller. He's the most talented politician I've ever seen up close. Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening. The big story around State Circle this week is the farewell to Thomas V. Mike Miller, Jr. The longtime president of the state Senate died a week ago today at age 78. Over the last 24 hours, Mr. Miller's colleagues and other officials have paid their respects as his body was brought to the State House. It was a building that Mr. Miller, an avid historian, loved, the spot where George Washington resigned his army command. On the Senate floor today, with the casket just outside the doors, members paid tribute to a man who made history himself by leading the Senate for an unmatched 33 years. And I really had the unbelievable opportunity over this last year to experience it personally and deeply see that more private side that cared so deeply about every issue that worried about this institution on a daily basis, that would stay up at night running through his Rolodex of senators and issues and places and geography. Where can we move? Where can we fix? What can we do better? Did we get this wrong? Can we fix it? Is there an amendment? Is there a way? People didn't see that side. They didn't see the, the, the deep personal feeling that he had for each and every one of his colleagues. That's the thing that people really don't know about Mike Miller. He had a heart. He had a heart for the little people. He cared about his community. He did so many wonderful things. When we, were, when we had to distribute turkeys and clothes and shoes, I would call Mike Miller and he would always respond. Within these historic walls, his indomitable spirit will live on forever, along with the values that he cherished and lived by. Respect for tradition, separation of powers, the dignity of every Marylander, and the greatness of the state of Maryland that he loved so much. Funeral services will be held tomorrow at 11 a.m. at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Clinton. The funeral mass is private, but will be live streamed on the church's Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash St. John Evangelist. With us now to share their thoughts on Mike Miller's legacy are four people who knew him very well. Attorney General Brian Frosch was chair of the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee Senator Nancy King is the majority leader of the state Senate. Rashawn Baker was the Prince George's County Executive, and Joe Bryce was the Chief of Staff for the Senate President way back in the 1990s. We're, we're delighted you could all be with us. And I'll start by just asking a, a general question. How do you think Marylanders and the state of Maryland should remember Mike Miller? Mr. Frosch. Well, uh, Jeff, he was a huge personality. If he was in the room, all the attention went to him. And the fact that he was Senate president for 33 years was not an accident. He's the most talented politician I've ever seen up close. And literally every law that was passed in our state over his term as Senate president was touched and changed and manipulated uh, by him usually to pretty good effect. Senator King? 
And I don't think that there will ever be another person that loves the state of Maryland and the Maryland Senate as much as Mike Miller. He, um, he lived it, it was in his blood. And up until even just two weeks ago, um, still was right on top of every detail, every issue. He, he, he was into all the politics of it all. And he, uh, he never gave it up all, through, through all these years. Mr. Baker? No, I, I agree with the Attorney General and, and Senator King is that um, he was a bigger than life force uh, in the state of Maryland and beyond because um, he had a presence not just in the state, but also um, nationwide. Um, but for me, I think about the, the, you know, the things that we were able to accomplish in Prince George's County in the state, and they were all because of the work of uh, President Miller. Um, he loved uh, Prince George's County. He loved the state. He loved the Senate. Um, and so here's a guy that um, is going to touch you know, in, in, in legislation for years to come by the number of people that he's inspired not only to stay in public service, um, but to put legislation in. And Mr. Bryce. Well, he was certainly uh, the most strategic, most thought out person I've ever met. And uh, he, he was complex to be sure. He had a tremendous work ethic. How I hope people will remember him is how I remember him in a personal sense, which was for his, his kindness, his generosity, his firm belief in family, his family, the Miller family, the Senate family, uh, and a fiercely, fiercely loyal friend. You know, we all got to see a lot of the, uh, the public, Mike Miller, who was very available, the press loved him, he was a quote machine, but, but you all saw him behind the scenes, which was a different thing, and we know he was always strategizing, uh, negotiating was a couple of steps ahead. A anybody have a, a story uh, that, that they can publicly share from those kind of encounters? Well, I've got one, Jeff. Um, it, it's the first time I met Mike Miller. I was in the House of Delegates, not in leadership or anything, but I had a very controversial bill. It was to have Maryland adopt California's vehicle emission standards. And I think to the surprise and, and horror of the House leadership, it passed the House by exactly 71 votes, the minimum necessary. And I got a call from Gerald Weinrad, who was in the Senate at the time and an environmental leader. He said, look, you gotta, go see, you gotta go see Mike Miller right now because if he assigns that bill to the Judicial Proceedings Committee, it's dead. If you can get it to the Environmental and Educational Affairs Committee where I sit, I'll get it through for you. So I, I asked for an appointment to see Mike and to my surprise, I got one that day. I went in, uh, I said, look, Mike, I got this bill. It's going to save the world. It's going to reduce uh, energy consumption, clean up the air, and it won't cost any money. But you need to assign it to the Environmental Committee. And uh, he put his arm around me and he said, Brian, he said, under our rules, I, I had to assign that to the Judicial Proceedings Committee. But it sounds like you've got a great bill. What can I do to help? And I walk out of his office, you know, and I'm, the knife is visibly sticking out of my back. And I'm thinking to myself, he just killed my bill, but what a nice guy. And he was just immensely talented at handling people. And I had been totally handled. Yeah, Joe, you, you probably saw some, some things handled in, in ways that made him into law and made him not into law. I think Mike was clearly the best uh, tactician that I've ever seen, both working for him and working with him. Uh, I think back to the uh, gun safety lot bill back in 2000, where Mike did not support the bill. He had a chairman who would have bottled it up and, and Mike could have appropriately laid the blame on him. Um, but when we figured out a way to get it to the floor uh, without going through the committee, through something that hadn't been used before and hadn't been used since, might let it go because that's where his caucus was. And I think he wasn't necessarily happy about it. I think he was a little proud of me for figuring out the puzzle. Um, and a couple of weeks later, the president of the United States was there for the bill signing. He just had a, an ability to move things and, and see things happen. Senator King would always just say, make it happen, just make it happen. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, and, and how do you make things happen? The, the thing I was going to ask you is the, the perception of Mike Miller was always in, in terms of where he sat on the political spectrum, sort of a moderate Democrat, but the leadership of the Senate was uh, politically more diverse and moved over time kind of away from him. H how often was there conflict within leadership and, and how was that handled? There, there was there was plenty of conflict in, in leadership, and we would behind closed doors we would yell and and argue with each other. Um, but he he was such a, a pragmatic, um, pretty moderate politician, I think, and and kind of surrounded himself with the members that that kind of felt the same way that he did. Um, I, I think that's just how how he worked. But I remember one time I had a, a bill for Marriott about their um, their training center and whether we were going to charge a hotel tax on it. And he was so fiercely protective of his friends and the people that were close to him. And I was on the floor uh, defending this bill, and I thought he'd have a heart attack before we got through. He couldn't sit down. He'd sit down. He'd stand up. He was pacing the floor, just um, cheering me on as I was doing the legislation, but he, he was just a fierce protector of his Senate friends. And Mr. Baker, I read in uh, this Maryland, Matter, Maryland Matters uh, profile of, of Senator Miller, where uh, you, you talked and, and indicated you didn't start off on quite the right foot. No, you know, it, it's interesting when I, you know, first heard of, you know, Mike Miller, I was, uh, as a Miller, when I was running for uh, the House of Delegates, and uh, and I didn't know much about Prince George's County or the state, and everyone told me I had to go talk to you know President Miller, and I'm thinking, what the hell does he have to do with <laughs> my district in the 22nd? He's on 27th, and so I had this picture of this guy who would hold me back, and so you fast forward when I'm county executive, and I'm trying to get funding for a hospital that serves mostly uninsured and underinsured. And the governor didn't put the money in the budget. And I'm basically in tears. And I go to him and I was like, you know, I'm yelling and cursing. And he's like, calm, 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 calm down, calm down. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it. You'll be fine. And we were. And to have him become someone that helped me bring the things mm -hmm. to the state and to the county that we needed is just tells you about that person, you know, that, that, he, that he is and he grew to be. Any of you can take this question wherever you want, but if somebody is going to write the, the Mike Miller Guide to Politics, how to be a, a successful politician the Mike Miller way, what, what should be in that? Oh, man. I think that um, I think it's to look forward to always be a couple moves of, of someone else. I think there was a misperception that Mike got his way through might and, and uh, yelling and screaming when you don't preside over 175 senators over the time that he was president of the Senate without having that ability to know people, to read people, and to make them feel like they were important to the process. And whether it was a senator or as a staff person, he wanted you to succeed. When you were ready to move on, he wanted you to move on. And that was true for any number of folks, both in elected office and who worked for him. I have to say that of all the years that I've ser served in the Senate with Mike, people used to think that he told everybody uh, uh, how to vote. And not once through all of those years did he tell me how I had to vote on anything. I knew what his hot buttons were. Um, we happened to agree on a lot of things, but never once did he tell me that I had to vote in any certain way. You know, I. I had the same experience. He and I were at different ends of the democratic political spectrum. And uh, we disagreed about a lot of stuff, but he, he never tried to push me around. What I would, what I, to just to spin a, a little bit on what Joe said, what I thought is his greatest strength was, was empathy. He got people, he, he knew what made you tick. And if it was a special parking place or it was your pet bill or it was a trip to New York or whatever, he knew what people wanted. And he brought them along with him because he was so good at, at figuring out what they needed and what they wanted. In the uh, obituary we ran last week, the last quote was from him about 20 years ago. And, and he said, 
whenever I leave, I just want people to say that the Senate of Maryland was a better place for Thomas V. Mike Miller Jr., who spelled it out, having been there. Um, and, and I imagine we all agree that was the case. And it was so important to him. Yes. We uh, really appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very much for helping us. Our thanks to the Attorney General, Senator King, Mr. Baker, and Mr. Bryce. Now to the news of the week. Governor Hogan is demanding that students return to the classroom, and that is getting major pushback, as Nancy Yamato reports. There is no public health reason for county school boards to keep students out of schools. Governor Hogan says 10 months into the pandemic, the science is clear. Data from Contact tracing and epidemiologists have indicated that school reopenings do not increase community spread. He says the state's positivity rate has dropped by almost 20 percent this month to 7.66 percent. And studies show that too many kids are suffering academically and emotionally. Our children simply cannot afford any more endless roadblocks or any more moving of the goal posts. The time has come to get all of our kids back into the classrooms and to reopen our schools. Keep in mind the governor can't force school districts to reopen, but he points out other states and cities have gone to more drastic measures, threatening to take away teaching licenses and pensions for teachers who refuse to return to the classrooms. We do not want to have to take such actions here in Maryland. Uh, but if a school systems do not immediately begin a good faith effort to return to the classrooms, um, we will explore every legal avenue at our disposal. Threats do not help people build relationships and get things done. Cheryl Bost is a teacher and president for the Maryland State Education Association, which represents 75,000 educators statewide. She says teachers want to return to the classrooms, but many remain apprehensive after getting conflicting messages such as this one from the state's acting deputy health secretary, Dr. Jin Lin Chan. That school reopening decisions should not be based on the availability of vaccination or the level of vaccinations among staff. It becomes very confusing for our educators and there, then that builds up a level of anxiety as to what really is the correct information to move forward. Calling Governor Hogan a bully, House Majority Leader Eric Lutke says Democrats will look into all options to stop the governor's threats, including an emergency bill. While parents will be able to choose whether to send their kids back or keep their kids at home for virtual learning, on social media, reaction to the governor's demands range from excitement and support to skepticism and outrage, with some questioning the timing just days after the inauguration. Both says she prefers collaboration over threats. I think we're so close with our vaccines, with uh, meeting the health and safety protocols, with the federal government coming out, getting ready to come out with some guidance, that let's not rush to do some things that could be harmful and moving too quickly. And let's let these individual school systems still follow through with their plans. I'm Nancy Yamada for State Circle. This week, the number of COVID-19 patients in Maryland hospitals declined by about 4%, but 265 people have died of the disease in the last week, bringing the state's coronavirus death toll to 6,617. Vaccine information is available at coronavirus.maryland.gov. This week, more criticism about the state's vaccine rollout, this time from some lawmakers. It has led to the creation of a new legislative work group, which will meet, meet weekly to keep tabs and make recommendations to help speed things up. On that board is Senator Clarence Lamb, also a physician. He says while the federal government gets some of the blame, Governor Hogan has under-delivered. Local health departments are overwhelmed. Hospitals are overwhelmed. They're getting flooded with calls because a very high expectation was set when realistically it's going to take some time for us to get this rolled out. And that's where the other piece is really important, too. The more that we have coordination and management on the state level, the faster we can actually get this rollout and meet those people's expectations now that have been set very high. For his part, Governor Hogan says Maryland is vaccinating people at a faster rate than the federal government is supplying doses. 
Maryland finances have been shaken by the pandemic recession. Charles Robinson reports on Governor Hogan's new proposed budget. Uh, this economic recovery budget and the Relief Act of 2021, with all of its immediate emergency tax and stimulus relief, are far and away uh, the most important things that the legislature must address right now. The 2022 budget weighs in at a hefty $49.35 billion. It lays out the governor's priorities. He points to several issues he believes will bring us back from the brink. Top priorities include a record investment of $7.5 billion to K-12 education. It will be helped by funds from the gambling lockbox. $411 million will go to higher education. There's a billion dollars for road and highway construction. A similar number will go to mass transit. Public safety gets $74.6 million. Mental health and substance abuse, $978 million. And the Chesapeake Bay gets $50 million in restoration funds. We look forward to doing what we do every year, and that is going through piece by piece to find um, and look at the programmatic changes and such. I am concerned that the budget is below last year's budget when the need is so much higher. So the governor was able to make the 2022 budget work through a series of actions. It included a hiring and spending freeze, as well as a last minute infusion of federal cash. The Relief Act of 2021 will provide nearly $1 billion in tax breaks and stimulus relief. Waiting in the wings this session is a veto override of the Kerwin educational formula. It calls for increased educational spending by proposing taxes on digital products and so-called downloads. The last thing that should ever be done in the middle of this pandemic would be to increase taxes on struggling families and small businesses. Like all budgets, it will get a review and modifications. In Annapolis, I'm Charles Robinson for State Circle. There's a new project underway to provide more community health resources for anyone dealing with a mental health crisis. Our Sue Copen reports. Howard County resident Gail Claus and her family know well the challenges of trying to find help when a mental health crisis hits. When we have needed immediate assessment for our son or assistance with a sudden escalation of volatile, unstable behavior, when furniture is being broken or holes punched in walls or siblings frightened by angry shouting that can be heard out to the street, then we have frequently been at a loss as to which direction to turn for crisis intervention. Claus shared her family story this week with members of the House Health and Government Operations Committee. The committee was briefed on a new five-year pilot program involving Baltimore City and Carroll, Howard, and Baltimore counties, funded with a $45 million grant from the state. The hospitals, the 17 hospital, uh, partnering hospitals, are the recipients of this grant, but there will not be a single dollar retained by any hospital. All of this $45 million in funding will go out into community-based care. The participating hospitals include Carroll Hospital, Howard County General, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Maryland Medical Center. The goals of the partnership include creating and promoting a regional hotline and alternative to 911 calls, providing support to outpatient providers to handle immediate needs, and to increase the availability of 24-7 mobile community crisis teams. A lot of times our families are winding up in the emergency department, and we really want to be able to provide and meet them kind of in the community. So having mobile crisis teams operating 24 hours, seven days a week is really key to this idea of being a comprehensive crisis now community. So great is the need, which has only gotten worse since the pandemic. The governor Hogan says he's included a record $978 million in his budget for mental health and drug abuse programs throughout the state. The hope is this pilot program, based on similar programs in Arizona and Georgia, will become permanent and expand around the state. But for now, the goal is to get it off the ground and into the community. We will never have this level of funding, $45 million to invest in, in, in behavioral health services. Um, you know, we likely won't have this opportunity again, so we want to make sure we get it right. Sue Copen for State Circle. Joining us for the Political Roundtable this week, MPT's Charles Robinson and Pamela Wood. 
of the Baltimore Sun. Pam, you were in the Senate chamber today. It, it had to be an, an emotional meeting. Yeah, it, it really was. Uh, for more than two hours, we heard largely from current senators, as well as some former senators who spoke via video feed. This is a pandemic and how we do it these days. Um, trading stories about Mike Miller, about what he meant to the state, about what he meant to them individually. It felt a little bit like part memorial service and part kind of group therapy session in the Senate. Yeah, it, it did seem that way. And, and I, I got to see most of it. Charles, I know you tuned in. What, what did you take away from that? Um, you know, listening to Steny Horio talking about his, his late friend uh, got to me emotionally. He also talked, there were a number of people who talked about uh, having both Miller's wrath and, if you will, his uh, personal touch on things. And I thought a number of the ladies in the, in the, in the Senate uh, talked about uh, his rough and gruff persona, but deep down inside, he was really this kind, gentle man. Awfully tough act to, to follow after leading the chamber for, for so many years. And when you think about uh, Senator Bill Ferguson, now the, the Senate president, uh, obviously, you know, it's just big shoes to fill. It certainly is. I mean, Senate President uh, Emeritus Mike Miller was legendary. I mean, 50 years in Maryland politics. He was a senator longer than I've been alive. Um, he was Senate president longer than uh, at least one member was alive. Um, and so for the next generation to come in, the Bill Ferguson's of the world, it, it is a tough act to follow and he's trying to chart his own path. Our thanks to Pam and Charles, and that is State Circle for this week. Thanks for watching and have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. What's your next move? Extend beyond your current position or make inroads into a new field through UMBC's professional master's programs and certificates in cybersecurity, data science, biotechnology, and more. Claim your future at UMBC. We at Sage Policy Group recognize that this is a challenging period for households and businesses. But Marylanders are intelligent, strong, inventive, and entrepreneurial. Eventually, this economy will bounce back stronger than ever. 71 acres in downtown Baltimore devoted to learning, discovery, care, and service. We train the professionals who secure the health, well-being, and just treatment of Maryland citizens. We create the knowledge that cures disease and 